Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Monday, the 8th of May, 2023, and welcome to another short video installment courtesy of investingsuccess.ca. Spring is here. Barbecue season is here. Smoker season is here. Doesn't this all look wonderful? Pulled pork, ribs, fresh off the smoker. I was recently contacted by one of the subscribers to my newsletter, and he has asked me if I would be kind enough to take a look at Lean Hog Futures for him, and I very quickly agreed to do so, and I've put together this little video. Now, before going any further, I think it's important that everybody understand where their food comes from. That being said, I am going to be talking in the next few slides about where your pork comes from. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a package of ribs or a, or a, a ham or a, a picnic shoulder or a, 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 board, a butt shoulder to put on the smoker, uh, if the images and the descriptions of how pork is processed are going to offend you, scare you, make you ill, Please don't watch this video, but if you do want to learn where your food comes from, carry on because here we go. There's a lean hog and it is these lean hogs that comprise the lean hogs futures contract and that contract trades on the Chicago mercantile exchange. So the gestation period for a mother hog is around about three and a half months. And after that pregnancy period, she will give birth to a litter of baby hogs. And the average litter size is around about nine little piglets. These piglets are fed a diet of corn, barley, oats, wheat, infused with some protein that comes from things like uh, soybean meal, canola meal. And this diet that they're fed is designed to help these little piglets grow. It's designed to help them maximize their weight. From the time they're born to the time that they visit the slaughterhouse, fattened is around about six months. So twice a year, you're going to see um, a, a hog farmer deliver his animals to the slaughterhouse. Now, at the time that they are ready for slaughter, they weigh around about 254 pounds. And after processing in the slaughterhouse, um, the carcass is going to weigh around about 190 pounds. And from that carcass, uh, you're going to get an average of just under 89 pounds of lean meat. Now, the lean meat coming off of that carcass will comprise hams, pork loins, pork belly, from which bacon is made, ribs, shoulder roast, picnic roast, and the remainder is fat and various assorted trimmings. So a lean hog contract uh, on the futures market is 40,000 pounds of lean hogs. Uh, the last time I checked, uh, the margin requirement to trade a contract of lean hogs is around about $2,000, which in the world of commodities is actually not so bad. Now, it's not all lollipops and rainbows. There's a lot of politics that are currently playing out, a lot of economics that are currently playing out. One of the big ones to keep your eye on is what the hog industry is calling Proposition 12 or Prop 12. And this goes back to 2018 when a fairly decent majority of California voters voted in favor of Prop 12. And Prop 12 basically says, if a pig has not been given adequate space to stand up and turn around in her pen, um, the piglets, that she gives birth to, 
that grow into lean hogs, that meat cannot be sold in California. Well, obviously the hog industry reacted pretty strongly to Proposition 12, and the whole matter is now in front of the Supreme Court of the United States awaiting ruling. I'm not certain what the time frame is for the Supreme Court to make this ruling, but uh, you know, California is a fairly large state, and if Prop 12 is supported by the Supreme Court, other states will likely follow, and that is going to put quite a wrinkle into the hog farming industry. So all eyes on Proposition 12, all eyes on the Supreme Court. Now, I've done some reading into some of the basics uh, in terms of economics. And I came across a, an article by Steve Meyer. He's an economist uh, in the agricultural sector. And as Mr. Meyer points out, uh, the COVID pandemic actually caused a bit of a change. Um, as he explains, consumers actually went through their cabinets and, hey, they found a frying pan. And consumers actually started to spend more time at home in the kitchen over the stove learning how to cook. And that actually has created a reduction in the demand for pork. Prior to COVID, consumers were quite happy to go out, to go to a fast food restaurant, uh, to get ribs to go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now consumers, thanks to COVID, have learned to use the frying pan. They've opened the recipe book. Um, and they're starting to explore their culinary options. So Mr. Meyer goes on to say that in the coming years, um, he doesn't think we're going to have a, a world of robust pork growth. He thinks that the growth in the pork sector is going to fall back into the low single digits. And he's also expressing concern about, you know, can the, can the packing houses get adequate labor. I mean, it's not the nicest job in the world to be working on a on a pork processing line as pork carcasses are, are coming down the line at you. Um, is it going to be easy for producers to expand their pork farming operations? Let's face it, the, the, the population is growing. Uh, cities are expanding into rural areas and nobody really wants to be downwind of a pork processing plant. So there's going to be some pressure on the ability of the industry to even expand. Um, the other one is uh, what happens to foreign markets. Now, uh, China, it would appear, is turning its focus to increasing its domestic production which means it will be taking fewer exports from North America. Uh, that's not exactly what you want to hear in terms of uh, pork prices going up, but it, it is certainly something that's playing out. And the other threat is um, animal disease. Um, there, are, there are some nasty diseases that can afflict um, young pigs, and uh, that, can, that can put... Uh, a producer out of business very quickly. And if a producer goes out of business, he's not likely to come back. And if people, consumers hear about uh, pork having a disease, they may switch to another meat and they may not come back to pork. So we've got to keep our eye on a number of these moving factors. And if you just do a, a Google search on Steve Meyer, uh, Partners for Production Agriculture, you can read more about what Mr. Meyer had to say. Now, um, according to the some of the recent articles that I read in Pork Journal, yeah, there is actually a journal for pork producers, didn't know that, um, the cost of production has actually risen since 2019. Um, it, it used to cost, um, you know, before COVID, something in the neighborhood of $60 um, per, per hundred weight to feed and raise an animal. That has now gone up to uh, somewhere near $90 per hundredweight. And so profit margins are getting a little compressed for hog producers. And if you've looked at building anything recently, uh, if you've gone to Home Depot to buy a 2x4, you'll know that the cost of 
hammers, nails, timber, everything has gone up. And if you're a pork producer looking at expanding your capacity, you're faced with some increased construction costs. And that has put a lot of producers on the sidelines. They are not going to go into debt any deeper than they already are to expand their hog barns. And in addition, uh, because of uh, reduced export demand, the hog industry in the U.S. finds itself with excess capacity. Um, there's apparently something like 1.4 million um, pens that are empty, uh, not being used, or, or that were taken out of production. And the bankers at Dutch Bank, Rabobank, uh, they expect a slight improvement in export volumes this year. Um, and that's all predicated on Mexico uh, continuing to import pork. And the Rabobank um, forecast is predicated on a recovery in sales to China. But like I said, it looks to me as though the Chinese are starting to uh, expand their pork operations domestically, which implies a lesser appetite for um, uh, imports from North America. Now, Lean Hogs, the, the, uh, the actual futures contract, traces its origin all the way back to February 28, 1966, and uh, started trading, of course, in Chicago. And what I find interesting about this first trade horoscope is if you look at the distribution of the planets, you'll notice that uh, there, there appears to be a square pattern in the horoscope wheel. And the square pattern is formed by um, the midheaven at 22 of Sagittarius. Um, 14 of Pisces is the ascendant, and the sun is right in there, and so is Saturn. The other corner of the square is uh, 21 of Gemini, which is Jupiter. And the fourth point of the square is uh, 17 of Virgo, which is where your Pluto and your Uranus are located. So again, if you've watched any of my videos on YouTube, you know that the strategy I employ is to watch the moon in its 29 day lunar cycle. And as the moon goes around the 12 signs of the Zodiac, what happens to pork prices as it passes uh, key points in the Zodiac? And in this Lean Hogs first trade horoscope, the key points are gonna be the four corner apexes of the rectangle. Now here's a, uh, here's a daily chart of the front month, uh, Lean Hog Futures. And if you're wondering about the gaps on the chart, uh, each of these uh, chart segments is a particular contract month. And yeah, there is a lot of volatility in lean hogs. That's why I typically um, have not traded them in my personal brokerage account. Even when I was a broker back in the day, um, I didn't really encourage clients to get involved in hogs lest they get whipsawed and, and thrown to the curb in a, in a heartbeat. So... Um, but anyway, if I look at the chart, um, yeah, I can see that, you know, here's a swing high back in August of 22. What was happening there? Moon was passing the natal ascendant point in that 1966 horoscope wheel. Um, here's another one in September of 22. Moon was passing the natal moon Jupiter point. Here's another one that corresponds to a gap down. Again, your moon passing your natal moon and your, your natal Jupiter point. Here's a swing high here in December of 22. Your moon was passing natal ascendant. And you can go on and on, but yeah, the moon is a predominant factor as it makes its way every month around that zodiac wheel. Now, uh, if we look at the price lows of like 35 cents made back during the depths of the COVID panic in uh, early 2020. We can see that, yes, the price of pork did increase dramatically. People were staying at home. 
they had discovered that frying pan in the cupboard and they were learning to fry pork chops. They were learning to bake racks of ribs in the oven. And yeah, there was a demand for, for pork. But then as uh, society opened up and people started leaving the house um, in middle of 2021, the demand fell. How much did it fall? Well, here's where our Fibonacci math comes in. Price pulled back 61.8% of the 2020 through 2021 increase. When I see something like a 61.8% retracement, that is typical. That is very, very typical. So what I'm looking at here is the fact that lean hogs uh, are going to correspond probably very nicely to Fibonacci retracements and extensions. And now from that 61.8% retracement, the price of hogs recovered. Where did it recover to? It came right back up to where it had been in the middle of 2021. And then what did it do? It fell apart. How much has it fallen apart? Well, recently it very nearly touched the 61.8% retracement level again. So now we're almost in a position to say, you know what? Hogs are trading in a very broad sideways channel. It's going to the top of the channel, pulling back to the bottom, going to the top, pulling back to the bottom. So now the bigger question is, are these things going to break below the bottom of the channel? That is the question. Let's take a look now at some of the chart technical indicators. One of the ones that I use, and I have access to this one on my Interactive Brokers account, this is the Ergodic Index, and it was invented in, I think it was the early 90s by a trader mathematician, his name was William Blau, and um, in my recent book that I unleashed called Follow the Trend, I talk in, in detail about William Blau and his indicators. The other one that he unleashed in the 90s was the True Strength Index. And I use these two primarily when I'm looking at the trend on commodities or individual stocks or even indices. So what do we see? Well, we see that just yesterday, the ergodic index slipped below the zero line. So we've now got a the makings of a, a dark brown colored uh, histogram bar. That's not good we see that the fast stochastic is down at the 20 level. Uh, that is indicative of the trend being negative. And we see that the true strength index is rolling over on itself, crossing over negative. So the, the downward trend is still intact. And so I would say the bottom of that sideways channel could in the next several days, come under some stress. It could be severely tested. It might even break. So do you buy lean hog futures here? No, you wait. You wait to see what that retest of that bottom channel is going to give you before you jump into these things. So here again is our 61.8% retracement level. It's at about 70. So we need to see what, what a test of that is going to look like. And let me show you. Okay. If it breaks the bottom of this sideways channel, if that 61.8% retracement level does not hold, where do we go next on the Fibonacci scale? 78.6%. That would take us down to 55 cents. Could that happen? Yeah, the trend is down. Anything can happen when the trend is down. Um, so, so the key message is don't jump in just yet. Wait and see if this bottom is going to hold because if not, uh, the trip down to 55 cents could be pretty swift. And so what you're going to be looking for then is the retest of that bottom line, potentially a break of that bottom channel boundary 
potentially something that takes you down near 55 cents. But you're going to know what's really happening if you just pay attention to the ergodic uh, in, uh, oscillator, the fast stochastic, the true strength index. Uh, as you see these things start to turn and offer you a hint that the trend is turning positive, then you can start to look at buying lean hogs. So um, the next several days, the next week and a bit is going to be very interesting uh, in the world of, of lean hogs. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, Financial Astrology Almanac is out there. Um, visit me at my website, investingsuccess.ca. I've got uh, all sorts of uh, interesting letters for subscribers. I can't possibly cover every request, every idea, but I, I do my best. And sometimes I will just take a request for looking at something and turn it into a YouTube video like this one. I recently unveiled a new Udemy course on udemy.com. Uh, this one addresses uh, the Fibonacci retracement and how that uh, interacts then with uh, the moon uh, passing by key points of a first trade chart. There is actually quite a connection. And as I said, I recently released uh, Follow the Trend. And this was actually a mantra uh, back in my brokerage days, my my branch manager was a, a pretty wise guy and he always used to pull me aside and he would say, Sonny boy, follow the trend, follow the trend. And, you know, my first reaction at first was, no, I'm not going to listen to this guy. But you know what? At the end of the day, he was right. And I have learned uh, to follow the trend. And so in this book, I introduced the reader to, you know, moving averages. I introduce the reader to Fibonacci. I take a look at various oscillators, indicators, trend following technical chart indicators. Not all of them are good. Some of them are complete rubbish. But I focus in the book on the ones that work. And I focus on uh, on the ones that don't work. And I explain why they don't work. And so after uh, perusing that book, uh, you will know which uh, technical chart indicators you should be using. And if you've been following me long enough, you'll know that how I do it is I will look at a chart. I will identify the first trade horoscope. I will then uh, make my buying and selling decisions based on the technical chart indicator in combination with the moon touching one of those points in the horoscope. And I will do that in conjunction with Fibonacci mathematics. And so that gives me a threefold approach to buying and selling and it's been working for me for the most part and um, that is what i do so thank you again for watching and uh hey go to the grocery store and get yourself some ribs and a pork shoulder fire up that smoker have at her have a nice day everyone thanks for listening